Welcome. Uh, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, uh, before we get, get started, um, just a little bit about my plan for these Lenten talks. My plan is to offer talks about Our Lady of Fatima today, um, Our Lady of Guadalupe next week, um, a talk about the Shroud of Turin, and then we're going to have a penance service on March 27th, so we won't have a talk that day. But that leaves one more Sunday of Lent, which would be April 3rd, for a talk like this. And uh, I want to fill that time by trying to answer questions that, you know, you guys have. So um, if, you, if you're watching this on YouTube, maybe just uh, either let me know somehow. Maybe put it in the comments if you've got a question that you'd like. And it can be a question about anything. And we'll try to answer them, um, as many of them, of them as I can, on April 3rd. Now, before I begin my talk today, um, I want to offer a little explanation of where things like Marian apparitions... Hold on one second here. I'm going to make a little change. All right, there we go. All right. Um, before I begin the talk today, I just want to talk, offer a little explanation of where things like Marian apparitions, modern-day miracles, uh, contemporary reports of messages uh, from heaven, where they fit in our Catholic faith. Um, the Catholic Church takes a very skeptical approach to reports of these kinds of things. And uh, we do not have to, as Catholics, uh, believe they are real in order to be faithful Catholics. Because everything necessary for our salvation uh, was given to us in Jesus Christ, and public revelation, as we call it, um, was uh, completed with the death of the last apostle. All right, there we go. Yeah. Uh, so, that said, God can and does still interact with us in powerful and miraculous ways. Uh, for example, there are credible reports of Mary appearing to people um, since the first centuries of the church. And so my point is, we shouldn't discount these sorts of things outright. Uh, rather, we should, as St. Paul advised, do not quench the spirit, he says in 1 Thessalonians. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Test everything. Retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of evil. And now the church's bishops uh, sometimes, you know, if, if something miraculous seems to be fairly credible, um, will actually investigate. And then sometimes the church, the bishops, will actually give something their stamp of approval and after they investigate it. And in doing this, the church is just saying that um, something can be believed, not that it must be. And if something miraculous is approved by the church, well, the church is merely saying that there's nothing contrary to the faith in it, um, and that belief in it may in fact benefit us. So Mary's appearance in, appearances in Fatima are one such thing like this. And you're not going to find it in the Bible, for example, because it happened, well, in like 1917. But Fatima is an application of the gospel to the situation in the world today. And it's brought to us by Mary herself in a very dramatic fashion. And really, every level of the church approves of the devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. And reports of what happened there, which was just an amazing story, which I hope we'll be hearing in a moment, uh, they, they are quite reliable. Uh, this wasn't really that long ago in the scheme of church history. Um, we have photos of what happened there. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II once even said that the message of Fatima is, to quote, so deeply rooted in the gospel that it imposes a commitment on the part of the church to respond. So, 
Uh, having said that, I know things like Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and even the Shroud of Turin, you know, the, the kind of topics that I plan to cover in uh, these Lenten talks, they can kind of rub a lot of non-Catholics in the wrong way. And, and I suspect there's maybe even a lot of Catholics in our parishes here. Um, we're a very Lutheran territory right here, right? Uh, we might not be overly comfortable with things like this. Uh, but rest assured, the Catholic Church is not like adding things to the core of the Christian faith. We are recognizing the fact that God is still at work in the world and that he often, apparently, works through his mother. Now, with all that um, groundwork, let's turn to today's topic. Now, of course, we all know um, that Russia uh, is at war in Ukraine. And it seems like Vladimir Putin is, is uh, maybe like, um, maybe he's like longing for a return to the USSR or something. And with hints of China getting closer to Russia, you know, like they're getting a little more friendly, things are looking a bit scary for the freer nations of the world. And one kind of wonders if we're only like at the beginning of a period of war and suffering. And as some have pointed out, the political landscape around the world is a bit, looking a bit like it did maybe before the world wars. So this situation, why am I talking about Fatima? As it says on the, the PowerPoint um, there, which I guess you can't see at the moment, but, but yeah. Why talk about Fatima? Um, well, this political world situation made me think, and it's making a lot of people think, about what happened in Fatima. It's the reason I chose this topic today. Um, I was appointed by uh, Bishop Kagan in 2012 to be the spiritual director for the Bismarck Division of the World Apostolate of Fatima, which is the church's official group uh, in charge of spreading the message, the authentic message of Fatima around the world. And when Bishop Kagan appointed me to this position, I knew nothing about Fatima, basically. So I had to start digging into it. And of course, right away, it was just overwhelming and confusing. Um, that's the thing. It's, it's really overwhelming. There's a lot going on. And uh, if you start digging in, you're going to find information about so-called secrets, the things about consecration of Russia. Um, it's, there's visions of hell, there's shepherd children, there's a, a miracle involving the sun, and it's all somehow connected with communism and, and uh, St. John Paul II. And, and even though the events happened over a century ago now, in 1917, it seems somehow still relevant. But how, it's not always easy to decipher. So my goal today is to break it down, break down the basics, right? There's so much more I can't cover in like the 45 minutes to an hour that I hope this presentation is limited to. Um, but I'm gonna tonight try to break it down. First, I'll briefly discuss what happened over the last century in Fatima. And then second, I'll discuss what Our Lady of Fatima asks of us today and how we can answer Our Lady's call. So with that, uh, let's go back to World War I. All right. Now, as we look back at the last century, we see a lot of great advances for humanity in technology and medicine and civil rights and the reduction of poverty. And like humanity has made great strides and this century, though, has also revealed to us the worst of humanity. Um, World War I, for example, uh, began in 1914, lasted till about 19, I think 1918, and around 20 million people died in that war. And Pope Benedict the 15th, whose picture you can see, uh, let's see, over there, over, 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 over there, yeah. <laughs> you can see his picture on the screen. Um, yeah, Pope Benedict XV was elected shortly after the war started. 
And he tried to use his office as the Pope to kind of lessen the horrors of war. Um, but the world just kind of ignored the Pope and the Church and its requests uh, for peace. In 1917, then, uh, praying for an end to the war, uh, Pope Benedict XV began a novena to Mary, Queen of Peace. He began the novena on May 5th. And on the eighth day of the novena, Mary appeared, 1,100 or so miles to the west of Rome in Fatima, which is why well, you can see up in the, uh, the map up there above me, um, kind of to give you a... Uh, you know, idea where uh, Fatima is. So Rome there in Italy, and then, yeah, 1,100 miles to the west, Mary appeared for the first time. And in her visits there, she brought a message of hope that the war would end, which was an answer to uh, the Pope's prayers. Um, but as we'll see, Mary's appearances in Fatima were about a lot more than World War I. In these visits, Mary uh, reminded us that hell exists, that war is a consequence of spiritual decay and sin, and that prayer and sacrifices offered in union with Christ have real power to change history, even to avert and end wars, to bring about peace. And she also made it clear that if prayers and sacrifices were not offered, well, and if people did not change, if they did not leave their sinful ways behind, war would return again and again. So, uh, having done that, explained that, now I'm going to try to quickly summarize what happened in Fatima. So, it begins 1916, likely in the spring of 1916. This is before Mary herself arrived in Fatima. An angel calling himself the Angel of Peace paid several visits to the shepherd children, three shepherd children named Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia. And I believe that it, yeah, well, there, well there's a picture of them right on the screen there. Um, yep. And they, uh, these children were very young, right? seven, nine, and ten years old at the time of this. And in these visits from the angel, the children are taught to adore the Lord, to pray, to make sacrifices in reparation for the sins of people uh, which, by which God was so offended. And this was all to help prepare them and to strengthen them for the arrival of Mary herself, because there were some challenging things coming for these kids in these apparitions. All right. You can see there on the left uh, of the screen there, that's a statue depicting the angel of peace, um, actually giving Holy Communion. One of the kids actually received a first Holy Communion from this angel. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, you know, it's also amazing that God works through such young people uh, like that. Um, well, even Mary herself, as we hear in the next apparition of Mary, or excuse me, the first apparition of Mary uh, in May, um, she was young too. Uh, she appears young here. And we do believe, of course, she was a young girl when she was uh, visited by Gabriel and, and uh, became the mother of Jesus. But So, now, after the angel of peace had gone, then on May 13th, 1917, Mary's first visit happened. The children were tending their sheep uh, when they saw what they thought was lightning. And then they began to lead their flocks home when they saw a woman uh, standing atop a holmoke tree. So she kind of appeared on top of a little tree. And as Lucia, the oldest of the three kids, wrote, she was more brilliant than the sun. As this quote is printed on your screen here. She was more brilliant than the sun and radiated light more clear and intense than a crystal glass filled with sparkling water when the rays of the burning sun shined through it. She seemed to be about 17 years old, and in her hands was a rosary, and uh, Lucia had a conversation with the lady, asking, where are you from? And the lady answered, I am from heaven. Lucia then asked, what do you want from, of me? 
The lady answered that she wanted the children to return there to the same place on the 13th of each month for the next six months at the same time of day. And the lady then asked, and this quote is again on your screen, are you willing to offer yourselves to God and bear all the suffering he wills to send you as an act of reparation for sins and for the conversion of sinners? And the children, of course, answered, yes, we are willing. I mean, these are little kids, little kids, and they're agreeing to offer up any suffering that God would give them uh, in, for the conversion of sinners. Um, you know, I hope we have some young children around here that would be so courageous to answer yes. Um, but I don't know. Finally, the lady made another request to them, and it's one that she would repeat at every visit. She said, pray the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war at the time of World War I. So in this first visit, we see uh, the message Mary wants to convey to us. Pray, offer sacrifices for the conversion of sinners, especially the rosary, and that world peace depends on if, whether or not we do this. So that's the first time Mary appeared. Next is June 13th in 1917. On June 13th, the children arrived at the same place as the lady had asked, and she again appeared to them, and Lucia asked the lady, What do you want of me? And the lady replied that they should return again on the 13th of July, and that they should pray the rosary every day. And here she says that Lucia should learn to read. Uh, the lady also said that Jesus would use Lucia and her future ability to read and write to spread devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, and this uh, picture on your screen here is, is a picture of Sister Lucia uh, later in life. She became a Carmelite nun, um, but she's holding books in this photo, so obviously she can read, right? Uh, she did a lot with that skill um, to spread the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Then, July. This was an amazing visit. I mean, they're all, of course, they're all incredible, but, but what happened in July was pretty astounding. Not as much as October, but let's see what happened here. In July, the next month, Our Lady appeared for the third time, um, just as she promised she would, and the children were present as well, and they were praying the rosary, as they were instructed to do. But then, word had, by then, word had spread, and a crowd had accompanied the children. And when you say a crowd, I mean, like, there were getting to be tens of thousands of people, you know, gathering for this. There are some photos of it, and you'll see a few later here, but thousands and thousands of people were coming. Um, a crowd was with the children, but here's the thing, only the children could see the lady, which led a lot of people in the crowd to understandably doubt whether Mary was really appearing to these children. But the lady again told the children to pray the rosary daily. Lucia then asked the lady who she was, and she asked the lady to perform a miracle for everyone to see, so that no one would doubt that she was appearing, because people were doubting. And the lady said she would grant both requests. She would reveal her name, and perform a miracle so that everyone would believe. And then, after this, things got really serious. Um, so, as the lady encouraged the children to make sacrifices for sinners, their vision, what they were seeing, the kids, changed. The ground seemed to open up, and it revealed a terrible vision of hell. The lady then said to them, You have seen hell, where the, poor, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. This vision of hell became known as the first secret of, Sa of Fatima. 
And people, I know one person for oh no, sem seminary professor who didn't believe in Fatima because he didn't believe Mary would show hell to children. And a lot of people kind of have trouble with that. But keep thing, a few things in mind. Now, first, these children had been prepared for this. They'd been strengthened by, the, by grace to endure this. Um, they'd been visited by the angel of peace and Mary herself. So it was important for them and for us to be reminded that hell is real also. And then third, you know, knowledge of, of hell can turn people away from sins and bring about concern for others who might be in danger of hell. So my point is it serves a purpose, right? Um, it is, there, there, there would be a reason that God might allow that. So after this vision of hell, then the, the lady revealed what was later known as the second secret of Fatima. She explained that God was about to punish the world for its sins by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. The lady said, To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. Pretty terrifying stuff. But she, she, she then says this, In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. So there is a note of hope uh, in the midst of all of this uh, terrible suffering. Uh, the lady then revealed the... what is called the third secret of Fatima, uh, which is a bit more difficult to describe in brief. Um, but the children saw images that turned out to be very prophetic. Among other things, this vision included an angel crying out, penance, 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 and reiterating the lady's request uh, for sacrifices for sinners. Uh, it also included a vision of the faithful, including the clergy, and a bishop dressed in white, which hints that it's the Holy Father, a pope, climbing a mountain. And these people, including the pope in the vision, had been martyred. They had been killed. Pope St. John Paul II, as well as Joseph Ratzinger, who was, of course, later the Pope, pope Benedict XVI, uh, interpreted these scenes as a summary of all the suffering yet that the church has undergone in the last century of two world wars and the Cold War. And Pope St. John Paul II understood that the vision the children had of, of the martyred Pope, the death of the Pope in the vision, he interpreted that as foretelling the assassination attempt that was made on his own life, on John Paul II's life, on May 13th, 1981. Now, May 13th is the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima. It's the day that Mary first appeared. And that's the day John Paul II was shot. Uh, so, wow. Uh, well, anyway, these the secrets, these three secrets, really have been discussed at length. And in a way, they've been debated too much uh, because the message contained in them is broadly the same. We need to repent of our sins. We need to offer sacrifices and prayers in reparation for the sins of others. And uh, if we do, there will be peace in the world. If we do not, the world will suffer. So that's July. This was an eventful day. Now, what about August? The next uh, month, August, the children, they weren't able to keep their appointment with the lady because they were arrested. I mean, think of this. These kids are like 7, 9, and 10. 
and uh, the local anti-Catholic uh, uh, civil authorities, um, they were really bothered by this, um, these rumors of Mary's appearance. And so they did what they could to try to get the kids to admit it was a hoax um, and to or derail um, you know, the whole proceedings by arresting these kids and, and threatening to torture and kill them. Yeah. So, uh, the lady, for her part, she just rescheduled the appointment. The kids were eventually released, and uh, on August 19th, Mary, well, the lady appeared to the children. Mary then repeated her request that they pray the rosary daily, and she repeated that she would perform a miracle for all to see in October. And she said that a chapel would be built, should be built um, at the location of her appearances. And all these things came true. There's a huge chapel there now, right? You can go visit it. And Mary said, then looking sad, pray, pray very much. This, is, this quote is right here on the screen. Pray, pray very much, and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell because there are none to sacrifice themselves to pray for them. That, I don't know about you, but I find that unsettling, uh, that this lady from heaven is saying, many souls go to hell. But there is some encouragement there too, because we can help change that by the offering of prayers and sacrifices. All right, now, moving on to the next appearance of the lady. September. When September 13th arrived, the lady appeared again and she repeated, guess, guess what? That the children should pray the rosary daily uh, for an end to the war. She reminded the children again that she would perform a miracle for all to see so that all may believe. Right? And news of this is spreading. As I said, there were tens of thousands of people there at some of these previous apparitions I discussed, but word is spreading. This lady is going to do a miracle in October for everyone to see. So, yeah, people showed up, right? October, the next month, October 13th, an estimated 70,000 people gathered to see the promised miracle or to laugh at the children and the Catholics when nothing happened. Um, and there were a lot of secular and even anti-Catholic uh, newspapers and so on. They were on hand to do just that. They wanted to ridicule uh, the Catholics and these children when nothing happened. Well, the lady appeared to the children as before, as promised, and she said, among other things, I am the Lady of the Rosary. Continue always to pray the Rosary every day. The war is going to end. So, remember, earlier the Lady said she was going to reveal her name in October. Well, here she just did it. And it's an interesting name. In choosing the title Lady of the Rosary, we see a reminder of the power of prayer to change history. The title, that title for Mary, and we're familiar with it, I hope, because I've explained it here in our parish, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, which is kind of a derivative of this, uh, Lady of the Rosary. That title for Mary refers to the, a time, the time in the 16th century, when Europe was about to be overrun by the Muslim Turks. The Pope asked everyone to pray the rosary, which many people did. And at the decisive moment in the decisive battle at Lepanto, the wind shifted. It was a naval battle, and the underdog Christian naval fleet was victorious. It saved Christian Europe from Muslim domination. The point is, prayer can change history. That's what Mary seems to be saying by choosing this name to offer the children. I'm the Lady of the Rosary. And then Mary kept the other part of her promise, the miracle. O seculo, 
which was a, uh, an apparently an anti-Christian, anti-Catholic newspaper, uh, which had written negative articles about the apparitions in the past, before this. They were there, but they had to change their tune. And they reported, the sun trembled, made sudden, incredible movements outside all cosmic laws. So, the sun apparently danced in the sky. It changed colors. Uh, people thought it was crashing to the ground. People thought this was the end of the world. Some people confessed their sins out loud. <laughs> uh, and then suddenly, there the sun was back in its place. And this is a very strange miracle, right? Because obviously the sun didn't move. I mean, not everyone on planet Earth saw it move and the solar system didn't fly apart. But in that place, that's apparently what it seemed like. And the miracle was visible 11 miles away. So there was no denying that something incredible had happened. And it gave credence to what the children had been claiming to see. And by the way, on the screen here, you can see a close-up of, um, well, first of all, on the one side, you see a newspaper. It's not the one I was describing, I don't think. But you can see one with photos that were taken on the day. And all the people are looking up at the sky. And people, like, there's an enlargement in the bottom here. You can see people, their hands are folded, and they're staring up at something. Another thing you might notice is a lot of them have umbrellas and apparently it had been raining and so there's another photo where there's this huge crowd and everyone has umbrellas and they're all holding their umbrellas up. But when this miracle happened, suddenly everything was dry. And so you can see in the photo, they're kneeling on the ground, their umbrellas are closed. So anyway. Thousand, tens of thousands of people saw this. It was reported in newspapers that had been hostile to the whole situation beforehand. So, yeah. That is um, the story of what happened at Fatima. It's a lot to digest. And so I think you can see why maybe I was a bit overwhelmed and confused uh, when I started to dig into it myself. Um, in all those events, though, there is an obvious theme. God, his mother, wants us, they want us to pray, to do penance in reparation for our own sins and the sins of others, and to repent of our sins, right? Um, and Mary gave us some practical ways to do that, um, which I will discuss shortly. But to finish off the little story here, um, yeah, so the three shepherd children, I'll get back to a picture of them, yeah. So these three kids, um, not long after the events we had described, so that happened in 1917, two of them died and went to heaven. And I don't say that just kind of out of sentimentality. They had an awesome grace that Mary told them they would go to heaven. And they were, in fact, uh, canonized by uh, Pope Francis on May 13th of 2017, which was the 100th anniversary of the first appearance of Mary in Fatima. Lucia, however, the oldest of the three, um, she lived a long life as a Carmelite nun, which I've got a picture of that, too. I showed you it. Uh, let's see, there you go. So she was a Carmelite nun, for many years, and uh, she talked frequently with the Holy Fathers. Do I have a picture of that? Yeah, there we go. There she is talking to uh, now Saint John Paul II. Um, yeah, so she was a Carmelite nun. She frequently talked to the Holy Fathers and others about the events at Fatima. She finally passed away just in 2005 which really isn't that long ago. But of course, this is not the end of the story. Mary predicted in July of 1917 because we failed, yeah, yeah. because we failed uh, 
to heed her request for prayers and sacrifices, and because the consecration of Russia was delayed, though it was done later by Pope John Paul II, a greater war did break out. Remember, Mary said, if we didn't do this, war would break out, a, a worse war. And World War II was the deadliest conflict in history, resulting in 50 to 85 million deaths, depending how you count them, right? And then later on, the Cold War, with its threat of nuclear annihilation, just dragged on. And that, we might say, brings us to today. It's a scary time, and people don't seem, well, too optimistic. As people with perspective of faith, I think especially, we can see with our eyes of faith how quickly things have been changing in our world. And it seems not for the better. Faith seems to be on the decline, at least in Christian, formerly Christian and Western nations. Uh, church attendance, especially after and since COVID-19, uh, it's waned. People marry less often in the church. They baptize fewer children uh, and fewer people confess their sins. Yet they still go to communion anyway. Uh, which is a great sacrilege. It makes things worse. Not surprisingly, then, God has been very effectively removed from the public square. I mean, to even mention God aloud, to even mention God aloud is uh, in the public square is to, to invite ridicule. Whether you're, you know, on the street, in an office, at a school, in a store, and ideologically, too, um, we are in trouble. What was obviously true and fundamental to society um, just a few years ago is now rejected, mocked. Whenever we say out loud, for example, that true marriage can only exist, true sacramental marriage can only exist between one man and one woman, or if we say that, you know, male and female are objective realities that don't depend upon psychological or interior feelings. We're shouted down. We're called bigots. We're silenced by social media companies and so on. And even more fundamentally than those issues, you know, human life itself is not respected at its beginning or at its end. Abortion is very common. Think about this. Something like 19% of all U.S. pregnancies end in abortion. That's like one in five. One in five children in the United States is murdered before they can even see the light of day. Since 1973, when this all became legal, that's something like 60 million deaths, which is kind of in the ballpark of the total number of deaths caused around the world, directly caused, by World War II. Just last week, I mean, our own president, despite being a Catholic, in his State of the Union address, <laughs> vowed to, quote, protect access to uh, the ability of mothers to kill their children. And half of the room of our nation's leaders stood up and applauded cheered. It was pretty sickening, actually. As I watched it, I had to, I just started praying the St. Michael prayer and so on. Oof. Also at the other end of life, too, at the end of life, uh, physician-assisted suicide is now legal in, in like 10 states in the District of Columbia here in the U.S. So it seems like sin is winning. And as Mary suggested, and as history makes evident, when sin is rampant, the world suffers in wars, famines, and so on. We wonder why this sort of thing is happening. But we can't ignore God's law without consequences. In the midst of all this, though, I think it's easy to lose hope. But if the events of Fatima and of the century that followed showed us anything, it's that God and his mother, they're not distant, passive observers of the affairs of men. They're intimately involved, and they have a deep concern for us. 
Um, our sin pains them deeply, and the events of Fatima also make it clear that we need to turn back to God, and that our prayers and our sacrifices have real power to change the course of history. So, what are we to do now? What are we to do now? World's a mess. Russia is once again um, a threat. Communism in China seems to be a gaining influence. All the errors in ideology that caused so much pain in the last century, they seem to be rising once again. War has broken out. What are we to do? Now, maybe a little sidebar here. You might recall in the July 13th, 1917 apparition of Mary, the second secret of Fatima, Mary asked that the Holy Father consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This consecration of Russia, it entailed the Holy Father praying an act of entrustment in union with all the bishops of the world, placing Russia under Mary's care. Now, some, or even a lot, of people complain that this was never done, uh, that it was never done properly. John Paul II tried, I think, at least I think three times. Um, but people will say it was never done properly, and that is why Russia is now able, once again, to cause problems in the world. And since the war in, has broken out in Ukraine, for example, Roman Catholic bishops in Ukraine, they've written a letter to Pope Francis. You might have seen this in the news if you watch Catholic News. And they asked him to perform the consecration. And I saw one among, you know, as others have said the same thing, but I saw one Catholic user on Twitter say, the only way this war will end is if Pope Francis finally consecrates Russia properly. But the truth is, St. John Paul II did consecrate Russia, and it was accepted in heaven. You know, there's no harm in doing it again, I don't think, right? Um, but we, we don't want to focus too much on that part of it. Did, was Russia consecrated, you know, to the exclusion of the rest of Mary's message at Fatima? The world apostolate of Fatima uh, has this to say about the issue. Heaven's desire for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary was completely satisfied on March 25th, 1984, by Pope St. John Paul II. Sister Lucia confirmed that this solemn and universal act of consecration corresponded to what Our Lady wished at the time, as well as later on, when she wrote in a letter dated 19, November 8th, 1989, Yes, it has been done just as Our Lady asked on March 25th, 1984. The Church has spoken on the matter, and the woman, woman through whom the request was communicated to the Pope has declared it accomplished as well. Hence, any dis further discussion or request is without basis. Right? And um, they, they continue to say, People can either devote their time to prayer, penance, and sacrifice in reparation for sin and for the conversion of sinners, as Our Lady asked at Fatima, or engage in endless debate over matters which... Holy Mother Church has already decided and proclaimed. So, yeah, the World Apostolate of Fatima, the official group uh, in charge of this, points out it was accepted, that it was, the consecration was properly carried out. We can do it again. You know, it's been done numerous times. We can do it again, but we don't want to uh, neglect the more important requests of Mary for prayer and sacrifices and penances. But how? What do we do? Do I have more slides here? Yeah, okay. What do we do? How do we do this? Well, enter the World Apostolate of Fatima. A little history on the World Apostolate of Fatima. So in 1946, a priest from New Jersey, Father Colgan, began a parish organization to promote the Fatima message in his parish. Uh, and he said... We in this parish will be the blue army of Our Lady against the red army of communism. The communism which Mary at Fatima warned would and had spread. 
and the organization, which was called the Blue Army, began to grow. Before long, uh, Father Colgan was working with a guy named Mr. Haffert. They developed a pledge in consultation with Sister Lucia herself uh, that people could take that listed the basic requirements of fulfilling what Our Lady asked for. And these two men worked out or worked to create a worldwide, not just the one parish, but a worldwide blue army of people praying and offering sacrifices as Mary asked. And by 1950, over a million people had taken the pledge. And eventually, this group, the Blue Army, was in 2010, I think, permanently granted status as a public international association of the faithful. So the Catholic Church officially recognized this is the group uh, that's in charge of, of Fatima. Um, so I just want to point this out, too. That means the World Apostolate of Fatima is uh, the group you should look to when you're looking in for information about Fatima, because there's a lot of other groups out there that make things more confusing. They sow confusion, or they have suspicious origins. Uh, like, they focus really hard, some of these groups, on the consecration of Russia issue, which I just talked about. And I think these groups should be avoided. They do some good work, but they also sow, sow confusion. And the most popular of these groups that I'm aware of is called America Needs Fatima. Uh, so that's not an official church organization. And uh, so I would just, you know, they do some good things, but I still wouldn't recommend that you look to them for information about Fatima. The World Apostolate of Fatima is the group. And uh, they do a lot of good work in spreading the message of Fatima. And what you need to do if you want to join the World Apostolate of Fatima is to take the pledge. And the pledge lays out the requirements of Our Lady in a simple list that's easy to understand. So you can take this pledge on their website, uh, which is bluearmy.com. Um, but here, this is what it is. First, you agree to offer up every day the sacrifices demanded by your daily duty. So whatever your vocation in life, you're offering up the hardships of your day. Um, yeah, so that's what we mean. Catholics, we offer it up, right? You agree to pray at least five decades of the rosary daily while meditating on the mysteries. You agree to, to wear the scapular of Mount Carmel as a profession of this promise and as an act of consecration to Mary. Um, you try, you, you, you uh, agree you're going to accomplish the devotion to the five first Saturdays of the month, which includes a, a 15 minute meditation on the mysteries of the rosary. And what that means, the five first Saturday devotion, it includes monthly on the first Saturday of each month for five months in a row, go to confession, receive Holy Communion in reparation for sin, and then you pray the rosary and you meditate on the rosary for 15 minutes. So you do that on Saturday, five Saturdays in a row, and you have carried out the five first Saturday devotion. So this pledge would help us to do what Mary asked. And the, uh, there's more assistance in carrying out Our Lady's request uh, can be found in what are called the World Apostolate of Fatima prayer cells, uh, which are groups of two or more people that kind of that regularly meet and gather to carry out Our Lady's requests for prayer, penance, and sacrifices. And there's also an educational component to the meeting so that people get together, they pray, and they, they learn uh, about Fatima. So if, you know, if anybody's interested in, your, in, in maybe forming one of those um, in your area, you know, I might be able to point you somewhere uh, where you could get that started. You know, the world really is a mess, and uh, we... Oh, is there more? Yeah, the world really is a mess. It needs, it really needs God. And uh, Mary, as she always has, shows us the path back to him. Fatima has got to be the most dramatic and recent example of this, of Mary showing us the path back to peace to her son. And if we want the world to be a better place, if we want to save souls from hell, uh, we should heed her requests. 
And if you want to know more about all this, uh, you can see on your screen here, um, this excellent book, Fatima for Today, right? Uh, by Father Andrew Apostoli, published in 2010. A great read. I've read it a couple of times. It is available, of course, in print, wherever you get books, but also on formed.org as an ebook and an audiobook. So if you want to listen, listen to it or uh, read it on your phone for free, if you're, it's free for my parishioners anyway. Your parish may have formed as well. Um, but yeah, you, you can get ad, access to it right there. Uh, a movie that tells the story of, of Fatima is called The Thirteenth Day. Um, it's kind of an artistic, uh, it's got kind of some interesting visuals, but yeah, it's a pretty good movie. Uh, and it is available on formed.org as well for free, in, at least for my parishioners, or if your parish subscribes to it. Um, and actually, there's been a, a new movie made in 2020 just called Fatima. And uh, you can rent that or buy that uh, wherever you can buy movies. I don't know if it's on Netflix or not, but like Amazon or, or wherever. Um, but uh, supposedly it's really good. I haven't watched it yet. I really should watch it. And honestly, if you just, if you're, again, I go back to Formed. If you search on formed.org for the word Fatima, you're going to find a lot of resources. And lastly, the World Apostolate of Fatima website which is at bluearmy.com. Uh, if you want, a, you know, that's where I got some of this information I've presented to you. Um, you can read about the consecration of Russia there. Um, yeah, a good resource. So with that, um, let us close with the Angel of Peace prayer, a prayer from the Angel of Peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly. I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifference by which he is offended. By the infinite merits of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. Amen. Thank you for watching. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.